Um, thanks for the invitation. So I probably know a lot of faces in the audience, but if you don't know me, I'm, my interest is in liver disease and in HPV and emergency endoscopy. So we're just going to run through half an hour, some aspects of that, based around three cases really, just trying to think about things that you might see commonly, encounter or be interested in. Happy to take questions during. You might want to save some questions up towards the end. I'm not going to be in the panel discussion later and I'm going to be leaving about nine o'clock. So just bear that in mind. If you've got anything that's absolutely burning, I'll try and come to you. And I may pick on one or two familiar faces as well. Um, so anyway, what are the priority areas? I think for you the priority area is having to talk to a very close uh, colleague that you might want to know about abnormal LFTs before surgery. You might want to know if your patient's got significant liver disease and that, how that might impact on your preparation and type anesthetic. What about risk assessment and liver scores? What do they mean? And how can I tell whether a patient with cirrhosis is going to run into problems with coagulopathy and bleeding or liver failure following surgery? And what are the outcomes for patients who've got chronic liver disease? What about the changes in hemodynamics in cirrhosis, when they're ill, when they're well, when they're decompensated, when they're compensated, and what's their actual bleeding risk? And how do you manage patients with acute variceal hemorrhage in the emergency setting? So who, who, who thinks that's a reasonable start? Has anyone else got anything they'd like to add? This is a liver amnesty where you can ask any question, but we want to make sure we cover them in half an hour. So anything you've always wanted to ask but have never dared to, now's the time. Um, anything else? We can come back to it if we need to. Okay. So we're going to base that around some clinical cases. I think before we go any further, if you are in the wrong room um, or you're not happy with the uh, refreshments, there is, is well, I know more than anyone, there's an AXA meeting going on at the moment, and everyone seems to be baking cakes. And I don't know if um, anyone recognises this, Julian. Um, but I said, how will I know who's made this cake? He said, well, he's quite chiselled. He seems to glide down the corridor. And when he's done the half marathon, he puts his feet in the river. Um, so this is, I think, Julian's cake that he made for, for AXA yesterday. So this is, if you think you're in the wrong room, you can leave now. Um, so what about background around chronic, chronic liver disease? So this is, a, this is a changing field, even over the last 10, 20 or 30 years in terms of disease prevalence. And on the left are data from 1993 when there were around about, uh, in the East Midlands, around five deaths uh, per 100,000 population per year. And that by 2009, that had increased to around 10 per 100,000. So it had doubled over around a 10-year period. And in the UK, there's around 16,000 deaths from liver disease, which is twice that of pancreatic or gastric cancer, around half that of colorectal cancer, but there's only around 1,000 liver transplants a year. So if we think that transplantation is the answer, uh, we we're asking the wrong question. We've got to think about disease prevention, and that's primarily around lifestyle, alcohol, fatty liver, increasing risk factors for NAFLD, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And over the last three decades, liver disease is the only disease which has consistently increased in, in terms of prevalence and cause of death. And this kills people 10 or 15 years younger than those from cardiovascular or other cancer deaths in, in, in your working life in your 50s and 40s. So you're going to see more of it. Um, and we're in a hot spot for liver disease in Nottingham. This is data from Public Health England, the fingertips data looking at admissions from liver disease. And you can see that in Nottingham, we're around two and a half times the national average for liver disease. I mean, that, you may say that's just because we've got a low threshold for admission. But if we look at deaths from liver disease on the left, this is the most recent data from 2018. That's not just gone from five to 10 per 100,000, but it's now at 30 per 100,000. So it's just exponentially increasing in terms of number of deaths. And Nottingham's got the highest rate for liver disease admissions in the UK. And we also are linked with Cambridge, where we send our patients for transplantation. So those two hospitals got the two highest rates of admissions. And the top 10, if you want to know where to go and live for admissions, so we've got Hartlepool, it's centred around the northeast, Blackburn and Hindburn, where I was born, here, top 10, and then you've got Burnley and Paddyham, and down here is the Chilterns. So if you want, like Somerset and the Chilterns, you can go and live there. You've got very low risk of liver disease or dying liver disease. But you can see it's a fairly depressing figure in terms of the, the rate of liver disease, so you're going to see more of it. I thought it might be quite helpful just to outline what our liver service looks like and where you might interact and cross-sect with that. So we've got um, a big impact with primary care. Obviously, we get a lot of GI and liver referrals, and we try and risk stratify in the community using blood biomarkers and direct access uh, fibro scan for GPs. So we can try and only see people who've, who've got a higher chance of having significant liver disease rather than just seeing everybody who's got a transient rise in their liver chemistry. We do community clinics both uh, for clinical and for research. We have a day case uh, unit that helps with liver biopsy, nurse-led paracentesis, Fibro scanning, we run patients through having cancer treatment with chemembolization and ablation, RFA. 
patients are assessed and then start their journey for tips there. And we obviously see, have a high endoscopic practice for EUS ERC people, around 1,200 of those uh, cases per year. We also have quite an active outpatient with uh, viral hepatitis, co-infection clinics with HIV physicians, obviously general hepatology, some nurse-led clinics. We engage a, a joint liver clinic with Cambridge for transplantation, assessment, workup and follow-up. And we have paediatric transition clinics. We're also involved in the regional cancer MDT with HPV surgery, radiology and pathology in uh, Lincolnshire, North Nottinghamshire in, in Mansfield. And we were, we're the centre for the viral hepatitis operational delivery network, which decides who and when people get treated for viral hepatitis. You probably see us most here in the liver inpatients, either those that are coming as emergencies or, or on the intensive care unit. And the overarching this, we're one of the on, only uh, two centres that have got an NHR uh, biomedical research centre in GI and specifically liver disease. So it's a fairly active department. And we've got seven consultants. A lot of those are 50% academic. Um, so what about abnormal LFTs before surgery? Who thinks this is relevant? Do you, do you all know what to do with these every time? So it might be worth just running over this. So we'll, we'll, we'll tag this around a case. So this could be for any procedure, actually. But we're going to take a 65-year-old female who's coming for a knee replacement. Uh, and what I want you to just to switch from is thinking just about the liver chemistry and the pattern of liver chemistry to thinking about risk factors. That's what cardiologists did about 15 years ago. What's your family history, smoking, lipid level? That will predict your chance of having cardiovascular disease. Okay? And we're doing the same sort of thing in, in hepatology. So your main risk factors are alcohol consumption, risk factors for the metabolic syndrome. So BMI, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, insulin resistance. Think about those things, and that will give you an idea whether this patient's likely to get fatty liver that can progress to inflammation, NASH, Inflammation with scarring, NASH fibrosis, or inflammation with scarring that's resulted in NASH cirrhosis. And that's a spectrum all under that umbrella of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So think about risk factors. In this patient, got a high BMI, um, modest alcohol consumption, but those risk factors for the metabolic syndrome. And when we look for patients with risk factors, when we've done this in the community, the patients who we end up finding who've got cirrhosis, 80% of them have got normal liver chemistry. So it just underlines the fact that taking a risk factor approach, rather than just being obsessed with liver tests, which are easy to get, but sometimes difficult to interpret, is probably the right way to go. So back to our patient. She's diabetic, she's got hyperlipidemia, she's got obstructive sleep apnea, and le these are her liver chemistry. I was, I was told to highlight the abnormal tests in bold. I didn't want to patronise anybody, but it just makes it easy to get through. Uh, so this is a patient who's got a raised gamma GT, a raised ALT, a raised ferritin, uh, AST ALT ratio of 0.7, bilirubin of 15, and albumin of 38. So, who's going to have a crack at this? Has this patient got liver failure? No. Okay. Has this patient got cirrhosis? Unlikely, possible, but unlikely. Okay. Are you worried about this patient going to sleep? No. no. What's the ferritin all about? Got hemochromatosis? Very unlikely. So the most common reason we see raised ferritin is a secondary hyperferritinemia in people with fatty liver from uh, high BMI or alcohol. You do the transferrin saturation, it'll be 35%. If we wanted to be sure, we could do the HFE genotyping to look for that. But it's not going to have an impact on your anaesthetic because their, their, their markers of synthetic function are normal. The albumin's normal, the bilirubin is normal, the AST-ALT ratio you'll see a lot on blood tests, and we're just going to talk about that in a second. So I agree with you. This is a safe, safe patient to proceed. They may need some workup to risk stratify themselves subsequently, but it's not going to stop you uh, proceeding with this patient uh, for surgery. Their platelet count's normal, their prothrombin time's normal, their user knees are normal. This is a fairly low risk. The, the liver tests are fairly abnormal, but it doesn't have significant impact for this patient moving forward for anaesthesia. So what perioperative issues might we think about for this patient and other patients with liver disease? Well, do they have significant disease? What's their risk of bleeding? Uh, risk of decompensation or sepsis after surgery? Uh, what about drug metabolism and analgesia choice? What about pre- and post-operative nutrition? These are all relevant questions, and it's hard to cover all of these um, just in half an hour. You may have an impact on wound healing as well. Thanks for popping in, Chris. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, um, so just coming to the coming, coming to the uh, risk stratification. This this data just really addresses the AST to ALT ratio. 
Um, and this is what we try and use to risk stratify. Sally got Sally made it in time, by the way, just for the record. Well, she didn't do the kids. Childcare. Childcare. Okay. We have a metrosexual amongst us. Um, so that's excellent. So good. So here we go. So we've got the AST to LT ratio. So what, what does it mean? So if you've got an AST to LT ratio that is less than 0.8, you take this top one. If it's less than 0.8, very good at excluding disease. So what does that negative predictive value of 93% actually mean? I saw a hand go up at the end there from Anthony. Yes, you just, I know you were stretching, but you might as well deal with it. <laughs> so, so a negative predictive value of a low AST to LT ratio of 0.8 of 93% means that only 7% of those patients with an AST to LT ratio below 0.8 will have significant fibrosis. And that means either bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis. It doesn't mean they've got liver failure. It doesn't mean they definitely don't have advanced fibrosis, it just means it's very unlikely. If you look at those with a raised ratio over 0.8, all of those patients don't have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. The positive predictive value is only 44%. So it enriches the group that may have, have advanced fibrosis over 0.8, but it doesn't mean that it's a very good test of predicting that all those patients will. So its, it's best utility is excluding advanced fibrosis. Do you understand that in terms of AST, LT ratio? That's about all you need to know when you look at that on the blood form. What's the chance of this patient having fibrosis? If it's low, they're unlikely to. If it's high, there's about a 50-50 chance. And that's not of cirrhosis. This is of bridging and of, and of cirrhosis. Okay? So you might have heard about Fibroscan. So this is a transient elastography. It's a probe that's placed between the intercostal space on the right side. It sends a shear wave through the liver that gives a reading in kilopascals. And it was judged initially to try and test whether French cheese was ripe. So it's developed by Ecosense in Paris. Um, and it's been very good, again, in its negative predictive value at, at excluding significant fibrosis. Um, it gives raised values not just in fibrosis, but also in people with act active hepatitis. So you've got active viral hepatitis or acute liver injury. If you've got bile duct obstruction or heart failure, it's just a measure of pressure. So all those things give raised pressure, and they can change if you improve those components of a patient's care. And it's also slightly increased in the non-fasting state, so we get these patients to starve before they come in. And if you've got a, a fibro scan that's less than 8 kilopascals, it's got a very good, again, negative predictive value. So if you've got a low AST to LT ratio, fibro scan under 8, you're unlikely to have significant liver disease and run into trouble. Over 13, it's, it's got a good utility in predicting advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, and the reading goes up to 75. And sometimes you get the nurses ringing, you go, we've got a reading of 65, do you think we should admit the patient? And that's just about stiffness, it's not about function. So it's just a pressure reading. Don't use that test in isolation to make judgments. Are we all comfortable with pre-op assessment of slightly abnormal liver chemistry? I'm not going to go through all the screen that you might do for different liver diseases, just in the interest of time. But are there any pressing questions about risk stratification from those liver tests using AST, ALT ratio, and fibro scan? I'm happy with that. Okay. So we'll move on to our second case. This is an emergency admission with upper GI bleed. Who, who would deal with these kind of patients on the on the take, let's get a feel for half or most, maybe. Okay, so you're seeing a patient coming with upper GI bleeding. Um, so this is our case. Uh, 13 year old gentleman, he's about uh, ex, he's a GEM student. Uh, you know, I mean, it goes without saying, doesn't it? Heavy alcohol, ex IVDU, uh, snorting cocaine <laughs> in the city, uh, and he's now a GEM student. 33, he drinks a lot, 80, alcohol, 80 units per week. Uh, he's been less well, he's been brought in by his friends, a bit confused, and these are his vital signs of investigation. His GCS is down a little bit, hemodynamics, he's mild jaundice, got some signs of chronic liver disease, he's vomited some blood, uh, he's a bit pale and sweaty and agitated. Do you recognise this? Fairly typical case. So here are his bloods. Um, so hematology, <coughs> anemic, low platelets, raised prothrombin time hyponatremia, raised urea, fairly typical for a patient with liver disease. Urea's up, kicked up because of um, GI hemorrhage, and these are his liver chemistry tests. So what do we think about this patient? Has he got risk factors? What are his risk factors? Alcohol, possibly viral hepatitis with his IV drug um, use. Um, what about his, I mean, this is your area, Dave, you're all over this. What do you think about this patient? Has he got liver failure? Does he need a, does he need a scope in theatre? U1, U3? You've done so an audit in this with... Yeah. 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 So the shock, there's reduced GCS, there's large volume blood, 
it's out of hours, all those things. Any, any of these emergency endoscopies should be done with anaesthetic support. And when we audit it with Joe and Dave and Tanya Monahan, we looked at mortality in this group of people who having accessing theatres out of hours for emergency endoscopy was the same as in the national laparotomy audit, 20% mortality in the first 30 days. So these are sick patients that need proper anaesthetic input and support. So the things that flag are the things we talked through. He's, that anemia, that anemia is, is probably acute. He's got significant impairment of synthetic function, and it's that that drives your mortality rather than the volume of blood in the bowl that you see in ED. So how bad is their synthetic function? He's also got hep C antibody positive, so he's um, got two risk factors. So how are we going to manage him? A lot of this management isn't actually endoscopic. A lot of it is to do with um, appropriate resuscitation. So we, we would aim for a uh, target hemoglobin between 7 and 8. There's two or three large studies now looking that restrictive transfusion in patients with cirrhosis and variceal bleed have a better outcome. I'll show you some data. Hematocrit around 24 to 30%. A lot of these patients do run slightly lower MAPs and uh, blood pressures in cirrhotics than normal. So we often tolerate lower MAPs in these patients, but this patient was still shocked. And they need emergency uh, endoscopy after appropriate resuscitation with support. Even if these patients are not septic, early antibiotics reduces the se subsequent sepsis rate and re-bleeding rate. And once they've had adequate volume, we can give them a vasopressor. We use turlipressin, 2 milligram IV bolus. And you'll see the effect of that in a minute when I show you uh, so some slides. And then they would go for band ligation with the airway protected. Just taking a quick cul-de-sac into hepatitis C. This patient was hepatitis C antibody positive. If you see that on your pre-op tests, that means they have or have had hepatitis C infection, but doesn't tell you whether they're currently viremic. So you'd want to check their HCV PCR, which will give you a HCV RNA level. This was back in the day, 1990. The hep C virus, as you're probably aware, was all around 89, 90. Uh, single therapy with mono, uh, monotherapy with uh, three times weekly interferon had a dismal tolerability and dismal outcome. And you can see now in the current regime of 12 weeks of a pill a day, we can cure 95 to 100% of patients for, with viral hepatitis, which is impressive treatment if we can access the people who need treatment. That's one of the challenges in finding these patients. So what about varices? Well, there's a normal esophagus on the left. There's these columns of tortuous vessels, often three or four, with blood flow from the GOJ upwards proximally um, in a patient with varices, and we can grade those. And when we look at patients who've got uh, variceal bleeding, um, I'm sure this start for us. So this patient who's being endoscoped, um, it accounts for around 15% of all GI bleeding. This patient's going to receive turlipressin in a minute. You can see a point of bleeding just at around the 9 o'clock position, and it's just venous bleeding. It's not... You, know, it's, you can't hear this bleeding, it's not that scary, but it looks like there's a lot of blood and it's obviously going to have an impact for your airway protection. This is why we like to do these patients in the theatre. There'll be a little white sort of bleb or white fibrin plug that will become evident after washing, just hiding under this pool of blood. And after totally pressing and vasoconstriction, even without endoscopic therapy, you can clean that up and see the target area that's been bleeding that can be banded directly and then we can band at the distal esophagus to try and get control of that bleeding. When we band ligate, we put a cap on, which much reduces our view. It makes the intubation a bit more tricky, particularly in GA patients. You, it's a bit like hemorrhoidal banding. You suck the <coughs> varix up, you put a band around it, and then it flops off, and you're left with a band around the base of the varix. And that can continue during the index treatment, and then we'll repeat that after two to four weeks. If you've had patients that you see on intensive care that have had this done, those bands will fall off and give ulcer slough after about three to five days that can persist for 10 or 14 days. So we would normally give post-banding PPI, ranitidine, or sucralfate, something to protect the, the ulceration risk of bleeding after that. Okay, so this is, um, we'll just lose the volume. Um, if we can, no, I didn't think we can. So this is Danny Stent. So this is an alternative to saying sac and Blakemore. We do an endoscopy, put a guide wire in the stomach. We then put this instrument over, inflate an anchoring balloon, just in the GOJ. It can be done with um, fluoro control, or you can do it without. You withdraw the balloon to get engagement in the GOJ, and then that allows you to fix the position where you're going to deliver the esophageal stent. And then as you release the mechanism to deploy the stent, the balloon deflates, you take out the introduction device, and you're left with a stent that's in the distal esophagus to cause wall tamponade to varices that have been bleeding. It's obviously not suitable for gastric varices, and this is just a fluoro image of the same thing. So you've got the stent that's being deployed, 
in that distal esophagus. It's around uh, 12 centimetres long, 25 millimetre diameter, wider diameter than those that we'd use in a stenosis because um, it needs to be held in place. And then we take that out after 14 days and we might have bridged them towards tips or towards transplant. And it allows the patient to be woken up, they can have oral nutrition rather than being maintained on ICU with a, with a um, Sangstack and Blakemore tube down. And the studies have shown that this is probably equivalent in terms of hemorrhage control, but much safer in terms of adverse uh, events. You may all have been experienced with um, Sangstack and Blakemore where they've been inflated in the mid esophagus and cause rupture in the right main bronchus. They're just really messy instruments that we need to look for an alternative that might help on some patients in intensive care. So in the, in the esophagus, they're fully covered. You can see them just um, through into the GOJ. And then we, we've got a device that can just resheath that atraumatically without restarting um, bleeding. So if that doesn't work, if endoscopic and drug therapy's failed, if we've used tamponade and it's failed, we then, then move towards TIPS. This is often done electively for patients with ascites, hydrothorax, or apatorenal syndrome, but an emergency situation for, for variceal hemorrhage. And, and it's really a, a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic uh, stent shunt, which connects the hepatic vein, which you'll be aware uh, feeds into the right atrium. So you access it through the jugular, like you're doing a line. Um, if you're anesthetizing for this, we try and avoid the right internal jugular where the interventional radiologists will be performing. So go from the hepatic vein, we make a false track through to the portal vein, and then you connect this with a tip stent, which you might just be able to pick up on the fluoro between connecting the portal vein the hepatic vein, you can see some columns of varices which can then go through and put in amplats of plugs or coils to coil embolize the varices. And that gets good control of bleeding. And if you're interested in any more about this, uh, Philippa, uh, myself and Avi wrote an article on anesthesia for tips a few years back in the CPD section of one of, one of your journals. Um, so early tips, um, not just waiting for the last throw of the dice after 10 days in a severely jaundiced patient, is very good in terms of bleeding control on the right and also in longer term mortality. So it's something that we reach for in people who've got child B disease with active bleeding or child C up to C13, and we'll talk about those scores in a second. So we mentioned restrictive transfusion. This was a big study out of Barcelona looking at giving blood restrictive on, only when someone's HB dropped below seven uh, versus a more liberal strategy, giving blood when the hemoglobin dropped below nine. And this scale's been expanded, but you can see that the absolute risk reduction between those two strategies was around 5%. So whatever else you're doing with GI bleeding, if you adopt a more restrictive strategy compared to liberal, you, your number needed to treat to say one death at 30 days is 20. And that's just without doing anything special with other drugs or endoscopy. So it's a bit like brushy cycling, these marginal gains, you know, trying to use rounder wheels than the Germans and the French, you know, trying to get all these little bits that can help you managing your patients. So think about early antibiotics, resuscitation before turley pressing, and restrictive transfusion. Um, so what about liver risk scores? We, you may be familiar with some. Um, this is Charles Pugh. It's, it's a very old now, but it's still quite good as a bedside feel for someone whether they've got decompensated or compensated disease. There's three blood tests and two clinical parameters, and you, your, your best uh, score gets one, and if you've got more advanced disease, you get three. So you can see that the most you could have is 15, and your minimum score will be five. So child's pew A is scores five to six, B is seven to nine, and C is 10 to 15. And it used to be said that surgery in child's A is um, um, relatively safe, although increased risk. Child's B, permissible. Child's C, extortionate risk. But there's some scores that can make us a bit more finely tuned in terms of predicting that. And we'll come on to the MELD score, which is the model for end-stage liver disease. And this was initially developed to predict death after TIPS. And it's not a categorical score like uh, Charles Pugh. It's more of a continuous variable. It's calculated to give you a number. And you can see that the higher your MELD number, which is determined by your bilirubin, prothrombin time, and importantly, renal function, the higher your MELD score, the higher your short-term mortality. So the criteria for listing for transplant is when your MELD's above about 15, because your risks of dying from your disease are higher than your risk of dying from transplant at one year. So... Um, as well as those factors, for people with a matched MELD score, hyponatremia also has a significant impact on patient survival, and that will be the same for people coming for surgery. So lower sodium is a bad situation. It reflects renal dysfunction and HRS in these patients. So what about decompensated cirrhosis? What do we mean by that? If someone's got scarring and cirrhosis but have shown signs of synthetic dysfunction, such as this, we think that is decompensated disease. And if they're suitable, we think about those patients for workup for transplant. 
these different stages of cirrhosis can be quite helpful in terms of predicting mortality. If you concentrate on the lower uh, numbers here, if you just got cirrhosis with no varices, your annual death rate is around 1%. If you develop varices, it increases. If you develop varices with bleeding or ascites or renal function or sepsis, you can see that gives an increased risk of death. So if you've got cirrhosis, do they have portal hypertension? Do they have varices? Have they bled from varices? Have they got ascites? Have they got sepsis? Increasing your risks of uh, dying during that admission, whether it's from pneumonia, whether it's from surgery, um, whether it's from um, GI bleeding. So in terms of the real liver function tests, I look at these, bilirubin, prothrombin time, albumin, creatinine, and sodium. And I think you should do the same, particularly in critical care areas where you're trying to predict whether someone's had a big bleed, but if they're child's A with normal values, they'll have a very high survival. If they've got advanced renal dysfunction, sepsis, they're going to have a, a high mortality. And there's a lot of causes of, of decompensation, which we've alluded to, and we can consider all these other things that can also contribute in a clinical context. Just a word about spontaneous bacterial peristalsis. Any, any cirrhotic patient that comes into hospital with ascites should have a diagnostic tap to look for the presence of SBP, and that can often be uh, asymptomatic. So they don't have peritonitis with abdominal pain. They may have no abdominal symptoms, but the rate of uh, asymptomatic SBP in, ad in admitted patients is around 10%. Uh, so what happens is you get bacterial translocation from the gut to uh, mesenteric lymph nodes, that gets into the bloodstream, ascites, and the chest, and it really activates all these pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause further vasodilatation and reduced renal perfusion, and that gives you HRS and ultimately death. And that can be exacerbated if you had a GI bleed or taking PPIs, and we treat not just with antibiotics but also with a human albumin solution because that expands uh, volume, increases renal perfusion, and you can see in-hospital mortality with albumin and antibiotics is improved, and as is the three-month mortality. So finding the infection and treating it appropriately with albumin expansion and antibiotics is really important. So just to finish and move on to the third case, which is elective surgery in, in cirrhosis, how do we risk stratify these? And again, this is cholecystectomy, but it could be, could be other conditions, other, other, other procedures that you run for. This patient has got autoimmune hepatitis, cirrhosis, hypertension. They're on azathioprine at a reasonable dose. There's a hemorrhage of people to the AXA cakes. Uh, that's quite appropriate. I think I'd do the same if it was going to be, you're going to be all on the plain digestives, I'm afraid, uh, by the time we get there. So, uh, so this patient's got established cirrhosis, albumin 34, bilirubin 19, creatinine 75, no drama. What's the, what's the three-month mortality in this patient, do you think, after a lap coli? 30-day mortality, three-month mortality. Rob, give me a rough number. Zero, 50%, 1%. Okay, we'll work with that. So the INR's 1.1, platelets... Slightly down, but nothing really that's going to scare you too much. Um, thinking about preparation, I said to Suzanne, you know, look, what, um, last time I remember going through this, it was when you're doing your, your FRCA, and I, I just remember talking about everything's in a cl clear, colourless ampule, um, you know, with a, a clear solution. I, Should we talk about this? And she said, well, you know what, I think probably not. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how well I'll go down with an anaesthetic. So we'll move on from anaesthetic, I'll let you deal with that. We'll come back to our patient with uh, we'll come back to our patient with cholecystectomy. So if you're going to use a risk stratification score, child pew's pretty good, but Meldy's on all your handheld calculators and is really quite good at predicting outcome in patients, not only from their liver disease but also after surgery. It's got an area under the curve of 0.94, which is really good in predicting your outcome. And in this this group of patients who were going, undergoing cholecystectomy, their mortality at 90 days was six percent. Okay, and that's that patient with those numbers that we've looked at. So modest changes, but underlying cirrhosis. And that would increase the high or MELD score uh, compared to zero, zero percent people without cirrhosis. And just picking up one or two other things, the patients that died were those more, more likely with ascites, renal insufficiency, coagulopathy, and prolonged hospital stay, which you might predict. And those are the things that should be sending alarm bells if you're looking at these patients. So you can get your MELD calculator. These are the numbers for that patient. The MEL score said even without lap coli, his three month mortality will be around 5%. So I would say that's probably higher than you might have anticipated. So if you've got a cirrhotic patient, you've identified them, running the MEL score, it'll give you an idea of how you're going to consent the patient and look after them. As you increase the MEL, you know, this isn't, this isn't dramatic. Bilirubin 40, creatinine 85, INR 1.2 might not even scare you looking at that, but you don't escape these numbers, three month mortality around 8% increasing to 12% with a MELD of 15, bilirubin 55, INR 
So actually those numbers are not dram- It's not bill room of 300, INR of 5. They're quite modest numbers but with significant impact. So I would just have a think about MELD and your patients that are coming to theatre who've got cirrhosis. So just moving on to the last, last bit really about hemodynamics and hemostasis, um, which is quite interesting in cirrhosis. And you, you'll probably have seen all this on, on your critical care areas, but we've done some work with uh, non-contrast MRI scanning with, uh, with our group and with, led by Neil Guhar, comparing healthy controls to a large group of people who've got compensated cirrhosis, so they've got none of those features of liver failure enrolment, and comparing to decompensated cirrhosis. And I'll try and distill this for you. It really just shows that you have a hyperdynamic circulation with increased cardiac output as you progress through those phases of disease. The liver does actually get bigger in cirrhosis. All your textbooks when you're at medical school, we knew you were wrong. It's not always a small walnut. The liver's often palpable and often increased in volume, but that then does shrink back to normal size when you have decompensated disease. You get inc- so an increased hyperdynamic circulation you get increased flow to the liver but reduced perfusion because of increased extracellular deposition of uh, collagen and scarring, and you get um, reduced blood flow and perfusion to the kidneys because of splanchnic vasodilatation, blood pooling, and reduced filling of the kidneys, which is one of the mechanisms why SBP and further vasodilatation further reduces your renal perfusion. So just looking at that in, really, these are the only two graphs I'm going to show you about this, which is looking at liver flow, HV is healthy volunteers, CC is compensated cirrhosis, and DC is decompensated cirrhosis. You can see that liver flow increases, and the proportion of flow through the portal vein remains about the same at 75%, the rest from the hepatic artery. That increases, but perfusion, judged by ICG extraction, decreases. So the liver is just struggling as you get towards that decompensated state, and that might have some implication for what you want to do with those drugs that come in a clear glass ampule. Um, when you're thinking about it. I won't talk about that again. I've learned my lesson. What about <coughs> renal flow? So renal flow is, is, is that drop in flow and slight drop in perfusion. And so making sure these patients have got adequate intravascular volume is important when you think about any medical condition and any surgery they may come to. Again, I'm not going to preach about TEG. You'll all be familiar. How many people use TEG routinely as part of their trauma or other surgery? So you'll be familiar with the waveform and the treatment products that you might give for different changes in the tag. So what I was interested in is whether that's any good at predicting blood product use in a group of patients with cirrhosis, with severe coagulopathy, who are undergoing procedures. So this is a group of patients who've got either a platelet count less than 50 or an INR over 1.8 or both. So reasonably sporting coagulation profile. And they randomised this group into standard of care, which gave everybody blood products up front, whatever you thought they needed, FFP and platelets or guided by TEG for blood, blood product, okay? So, do you understand the concept? So, coagulopathy, everyone gets blood products to try and correct their coagulation, or we use TEG to predict whether you need platelets, cryo, FFP, or a combination. So, using TEG to do that and looking at the TEG results, what proportion of patients with those blood parameters do you think would access the need for blood products? 100%? 75%? 50%? Okay, it's really interesting. So in this group, uh, 16% of patients met the criteria by TEG to access blood products, even with those blood parameters. So it's an important concept in cirrhosis is that conventional tests and even TEG means that you probably need to use fewer uh, coagulation products than you might need compared to standard patients without liver disease. This is rebalanced hemostasis. And in terms of outcomes, procedure-related bleeding, there was only one episode of bleeding. It's a small study, but one episode of bleeding in the control group, and there was no episodes of bleeding in the TEG group, even though they received a fraction of the amount of blood products. So 17% of the blood products you d- detected by, uh, required by TEG, very low rate bleed, adverse bleed outcome. And there's this concept of rebalanced hemostasis in cirrhosis, and there's all these different factors, both pro- and anticoagulant factors that feed into hemostasis and cirrhosis. And if you think about it simply, I need to think about things simply, you get this rebalance. They're still present in equilibrium, but there's less of them. And the implications that has is that you still have a thrombosis risk, and that's significant and can accelerate your underlying liver disease, particularly with portal vein thrombosis. Um, And bleeding risk is probably less than predicted by conventional tests in other conditions. So I'm going to finish that and just conclude, um, really. So I think you should consider risk factors rather than just liver blood tests and those simple non-invasive tests to decide whether your patient's got underlying liver disease. Uh, There are increased risks 
in patients with cirrhosis, probably more than you may anticipate even for those patients with well-compensated disease. Liver risk scores may help you predict adverse outcomes and think about who may access treatment. Non-endoscopic treatment we talked about can improve survival, not just endoscopy. And there's that rebalanced hemostasis that you might need to consider in the patients that you're seeing. I've got nothing else to say, Rob, unless there's any questions. Thanks. This is our, this is our, this is our uh, liver. This is Bile Salona, is our football team. So if you want to come up with a name and a team and anaesthetics, we'll, um, we'll have a game. Yeah.